Hello and welcome. You know, wait for a, a lot of our people to uh, to join us and catch up. This was kind of an impromptu uh, get together. I, I really wanted to make it uh, live because I want it to be authentic and current. Uh, and I know that there are people that will have questions both during the stream uh, and after the stream. And also for those of you that may find your way to the stream, uh, you know, at a later date, whether it's later on this evening or sometime during the upcoming week, I want you to understand that this will probably be recorded and you'll have access to it on whatever social media platform uh, that you find yourself. First and foremost, Happy New Year. Happy 2024. Hopefully you had a great holiday season. Uh, my wife and I just returned from Dallas. We went to the ABCA uh, Coaches Convention had a wonderful time, got to meet a lot of great people uh, from social media. And I can't, I was blown away and I deeply heartfelt and really sincerely appreciative of all of the people that, that found their way up to Podcast Row, uh, up on the third floor, the Gaylord in Dallas. Uh, I got to meet great people like J.J. Munoz and Many, many coaches, uh, even met people from as far away as Japan. Um, it was really eye-opening, uh, and I am humbled, and I am completely honored uh, to have been able to meet so many great people. So the purpose of this evening is during the last several weeks, as tends to be the case, you know, we're starting to get up on baseball season. You know, annual tradition, the ABCA and college baseball season begins. And when college baseball begins, the motors of student athletes and parents, you know, begins to rumble uh, with regard to, you know, the recruiting and youth baseball experiences that lie ahead. And, you know, I am very conscious of that and very aware of that. And I, and I tend to get a lot of questions uh, that I feel are best served by answering them on this type of forum. You know, each and every week, uh, myself and Dave Serrano, Coach Serrano, we talk to a lot of college coaches. And, you know, that has always led to me being uneasy because I really feel like we need to be spending more time with the younger levels of baseball. And so I'm going to break tonight's kind of discussion down into a few different levels. The first is youth baseball slash travel baseball. The next is going to be high school and college recruiting. And so I feel it's important for parents to understand, you know, if you look, if you look at social media as your guide, there's a lot of fear that gets spread, meaning, oh, there's a pending doom and there's a you know big cliff coming and you need us. And, and, and it kind of, I get it from a business standpoint. I get it. People want to create a sense of urgency or a validation as to why you may need or seek out um, help or guidance. I absolutely understand that. The first thing to understand is not all youth baseball slash travel baseball is created the same, you know, and as an industry, uh, as a, I love the sport of baseball, uh, my family, uh, my boys, we, you know, eat, sleep, drink, love, passionate about the baseball. It, uh, for us, it's just something that we, we thoroughly enjoy and try to immerse ourselves in during baseball season. You know, the biggest thing is, is as a young boy, for me personally and my sons, uh, we were able to develop relationships. We had fun. We had great mentors. We had great coaches. Uh, and really, we had that community feel, myself and Lynn in Fitchburg, Mass., and my sons in Auburn, Mass. Um, you know, and everybody seems to, to think that, you know, within the travel ball world of youth baseball, that, you know, it's better. It's going to make my son better or daughter better. It's going to be more competitive. Now, that may be true for some instances. But we have a lot of parents that are wondering about, is it more competitive? Is there better coaching, et cetera? And, and I really want parents to understand that, you know, all 
travel teams, all travel organizations. Some do it tremendously well. Some are in it just for the money and others just don't do it well at all. And so that's an independent choice, but never follow, you know, other people based on the history of, of, of their program. Meaning when a program says we've sent hundreds of, you know, thousands of boys on to play college and we have hundreds of draft picks, that world has changed completely. And that's why we're having this discussion. The world of travel baseball no longer fits the current narrative of high school athletes. It no longer applies really for the most part or as, as much as it did at one time with regard to high school and college recruiting. In today's world, in fact, high school athletes are the last guy on the totem pole. That's not my opinion. That's not anything that is subject to debate. Uh, it's still an integral part of, of recruiting at the college level. But it's going to be transfer portal, JUCO, postgraduate, high school, in that order for the foreseeable future and for many years to come until there are changes. And so travel baseball, you know, they utilize the success of their past athletes as a marketing tool or marketing arm in order to entice new uh, families or new athletes into their program. What I wanted to try to share with you tonight is a, a sense of calm. You know, dealing with parents, they think that as young as eight to maybe 15, that the travel organization that they choose is in some way going to have some kind of influence on where they play in college. That's not accurate. The other thing that I want you to understand is it's imperative. And you've heard me repeat this on numerous occasions that we need to begin to enjoy the journey rather than focus so much on the attention of the destination. Uh, you know, the biggest part of it is the sport of baseball is hard, whether it's you're young, whether you're a seasoned veteran at the college level or beyond and professional. You know, I have a friend, uh, and many of you know him, uh, Bob Tewksbury, who is on, uh, you know, very very active on Twitter. And he recently had a big picture of a pyramid. And, you know, the pyramid was in basically three colors, dark brown that covered 90% of the pyramid. And then maybe a yellow that was like maybe 7%. And then the top part of the pyramid was blue was like at the top, very top, the pinnacle of the pyramid. And that was the college player and professional player. And we seem to all be focused on that yellow and the blue, but we're not paying attention to the brown. And the brown is the millions of boys and girls that play youth baseball and softball. And then they ultimately play in their middle school or junior high school, and then ultimately their high school. The common thread there is community, the competitive spirit within the communities. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, that, that cream, they rise to the top. You know, so if we begin to look at just purely based on statistics, just to, just looking at numbers, hard factual statistics, you know, 1% of boys that girls that start to play youth sports will, will play division one athletics. In fact, a lot of families don't recognize that out of the 12,000 approximate student athletes that play NCAA division one baseball, Really, only half of those are active. The other half are like on the 40-man rosters. They may be redshirted. They may not play. They may be, uh, you know, in development some, in some cases in some programs. Um, they may be gray-shirted, which is a whole other um, dynamic. But for the most part, it's 27-man travel roster. And of that 27-man travel roster, 15 are pitchers, 12 are position players. My point is, if we utilize the number 12 of position players, and we use the approximate 300 Division One programs, that's 3,600 active Division One baseball players. Really minute number. And so, you know, my point of having this discussion this evening was to get parents to understand from the very young ages, we do not want to chase a, a, a un, 
unseen, undetermined, pre, you know, destination. We want to choose a path. We want to choose a path of skill set development while having fun, while developing a passion. You know, Tamara uh, Seaman is a mom and she's also a mental health uh, coach down in Georgia. She's a former Division I Duke athlete. Her husband is a former Division I baseball player at Wake Forest. And she uses a great term, and it's grit before grind. And grit is the development of a passion. Grit is the development of a love, a passion for the sport. Without grit, there can be no grind. There can be no working towards, because if you don't have it in your heart, then you can't work towards something that you're not passionate about. Uh, I want to let people know when I put my glasses on, I see all of the stuff that's coming on Tanner and Jonathan. Thank you very much for your. So, you know, when we start talking about the development of young athletes, you know, I get it. I'm a dad, I'm a grandfather. And what I want to, you know, I always want what is going to help my sons achieve a better life or the perceived value of having a better life. You know, the same thing is being, you know, for my grandsons, but I cannot make, I could never make my sons want to do something. So if they wanted to play basketball, we play basketball. We want to play hockey, we play hockey. My point is, it's important for us to return the innocence of childhood. And I get where a lot of people start to think this is corny or hokey. But at six years old, do we really need to worry about your son or daughter being elite or being ultra competitive or advanced? Now, I don't know any... There are some student, you know, children, kids that are faster at a younger age. They're stronger. They're bigger. You know, but that doesn't mean they're going to be that when they're 16 or 18. What lies ahead at the high school and obviously the college level is the hammer of truth, the hammer of comp competition. And that hammer can hit really, really hard. The truth is, at high school and college, winning matters. And, it, and they, you know, when they're younger, you know, we develop and we foster to some degree, okay, it doesn't work out, let's, let's shift gears and go a different direction, rather than trying to overcome obstacles at a young age. But getting back to that, the, the innocence, the organic um, spirit of learning how to resolve differences, conflict resolution, how to compete with your best friend who's much faster than you and much more athletic than you when they're seven, eight, 10 years old. Uh, those types of things, we've kind of denied the, the children. And I don't want to go down this path too much, but when I start to tell parents about what lies ahead, you know, every parent at 14, 13, 14, 15, my son wants to play college athletics. Okay, the path of travel baseball or travel sports is not the journey, it's not the path because it's going in a step by step business orderly development. 10, 11, 12, 13. Yet at high school and college, it's 15 through 19, and college is 19 through 23. You know, I talked to a lot of college coaches this past week, and they all say to a man, Hey, I got some guys that come in in the fall. They go into the locker room and they go into the weight room and they look around at that 22, 23, and in some cases, 24-year-old. Holy cow, I'm not used to that. I'm used to just guys being my own age. And so travel baseball is a totally different narrative now. It's a totally different world. It had its place. It has, has its place today if you're utilizing it with the right mindset, which is to help with the development of a competitive athlete. If your focus as a parent, or more importantly, as a student athlete, is to utilize travel ball to seek out the best competition and to compete against student athletes that share the same passion and love for the game, and everybody's aspiring to be the best that they're capable of being, great in environment. If you're, if you're putting yourself in an environment where you're being coached, and when I say coached, when there's discipline, there's routine, there's structure, there's a focus on skill set development, not trying to copy in a robotic manner, somebody's swing, somebody's grip under the pitcher, but 
an individual approach to development to the individual athlete, great program. If you're trying to ride the pony of the teams who have sent players off to college for a decade, over a decade, that ship has sailed. That's gone. Those days are never coming back. It's because, and I wrote this book, and this is not a situation to digress into my book, the shift, which I, I am like blown away that more people don't ask me about the shift. That book clearly tells the story of what has transpired. It predicted all of the rule changes. And the thing is, is that the changes from Major League Baseball were, were, were sizable and it rippled all the way down into high school. And when you say, how did it ripple to high school? Major League Baseball no longer drafts the amount of high school student athletes it did, you know, pre-COVID. It just doesn't. It forces athletes from high school to go to college. More demand on college uh, positions. More demand on on JUCO. And it's not just NCAA Division One. You have more players than ever. The transfer portal is not just a Division One issue, and I'm going to get to that in a second. And so travel baseball and youth baseball, we need to find our way back to high school baseball. High school coaches are not your enemy. High school coaches are mentors. High school coaches, they get it right because they see your sons and daughters on a daily basis. Now, we can all agree to disagree. Does your son belong at shortstop? Does your son belong as a starting pitcher, et cetera? I've been there as a dad. Even when I was a college coach, I get it. But at the end of the day, if you can't deal with the issues of competitive environment in high school, how in the world are you going to deal with the competitive issues in college where they're 100 times more challenging than high school? I can promise you that. Let's start to talk numbers for a second. Your local community, I don't care where you watch this or where you find yourself watching this later in, later in the week, later in the month, later in the year. Your local community, you may have the best high school team in the state. If you have a great senior class, you may have three or four boys that will go on to play various levels of college. But I tell you this because Little League or youth baseball goes from millions of players to approximately 400,000, 300,000 high school players to 45,000 NCAA and, and, and NAIA players. And then there's a few thousand JUCO players. So in total, there's between 50 and 60,000 players that play college baseball. And of that, every year now, only 600 to 700 get offered the opportunity to enter professional baseball. So my point of telling you all of this is numbers tell us the best recruiting services, the best instructors, the best baseball academies, they can't possibly get all the people that they want to get into college, they cannot fulfill the promise of making sure our children are Division I athletes or professional players. It's just statistically impossible. There's just no room at that end, no matter how loud we want to scream and yell. And that's the other topic that I want to broach on with regard to um, – you know, the environment of instructors and, you know, we go on social media and we see people that want to, you know, kind of scream or be very aggressive with they've discovered the answer or they have the blueprint or they trust me when I tell you the sport has been around for uh, you know, we're not Abner Doubleday. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're just we're disseminating information and we're teaching what we perceive the movements to be. But at the end of the day, baseball boils down to basic fundamental skills. Throwing, catching, hitting. Those that can throw and catch really well, those that can hit really well, they're going to continue to move up. But because it's so difficult, a lot of younger players, they find other areas of interest. They find other sports. They find other... Uh, things to do with their time, i.e. academics, ID, socially, whatever. But baseball, the rubber hits the road between 13 and 15. That's where things begin to shake out. That's where we find athletes. I'm going to play a different sport. I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm going to spend my time doing other things. 
Now, the ones that choose to stay the course, you know, that three, four hundred thousand with regard to high school athletics. I promise you, even if you have the best travel experience in the best travel program, and there's a lot of those out there. But I promise you, your high school years matter. I, I, I find myself at odds when I'm talking to parents who come at me with our high school program stinks, our high school coach stinks, the level of competition stinks. Okay, you have one chance, one three to four year period. Uh, for me, it was three years. In today's world, it's four years, freshman through senior, to be a high school kid. And all that goes along with being a high school kid. You're going to meet your girl, first girlfriend. You're going to have your first girlfriend, I, I think. You're going to drive. You're going to learn how to drive. You're going to have acne. You're going to have struggles, ups and downs, ebbs and flows with relationships and friends. And it's a really uh, an emergence of the little boy becoming a young man or young girl, young woman, et cetera. And so what I try to encourage parents is don't overlook the high school experience with regard to friendships and relationships and that that community bond of it mattering that you belong to something bigger than yourself. This time in a young student's life is where celebration of others and others' successes begins to teach them an important component that will make or break them as a college athlete or beyond. And it's not always about the me. You know, we talk when we start to talk to parents, uh, when I talk to parents, it's, it seems to be about exit velocity, launch angle, my arm speed. You know, I throw at 90. I have exit velocity of this and all my it's me. I do. And it's not we, us and our. And that's a slippery slope that once you go down that path, you begin to learn baseball is a game. That is nine players on the field at one time, but more importantly, you got to have some depth. You got to have some people on your bench that you can count on, whether they're pitches or position players. And you really need to celebrate the we, us, and our. And you know that's something that I feel high school really brings. So it's important as parents uh, and student athletes to have a great understanding um, with regard to uh, the entire. Uh, experience as a whole, um, you know, when it comes to tra travel versus youth baseball, what is the end game? What is, why are we going to travel? What's the point of travel? And I'm talking now 6 through 12. And those ages, you want to keep it fun. You want to keep it really engaged. And sometimes there can be a disconnect when we're driving children uh, a significant difference. And I get it. You want to surround your son or daughter with a lot of similar competitive minded athletes. But what I want you to understand is, is that keeping it fun, keeping it passionate uh, at younger ages is going to lead to that as they enter that 13 through 15 middle school and into high school. So now let's talk about college recruiting, which is why a lot of you come here and, and send me questions. And I want to make sure that I specifically tell you that, you know, when I'm talking to college coaches, and I must say this 8,000 times, uh, physicality, you know, I, I've, I've used that word so often and a lot of parents roll their eyes, you know, and I talked to Tommy Moffat and I talked to Eric Cressy and Mike Reinold and, and Nunzio and a lot of people that are within the world of strength. Why physicality is such a big deal is because college coaches now have options that they did not have options before. So this isn't my opinion or anybody else in this space's opinion. This is just a, the way we live in today's world. It is more to do with a college coach can go to a JUCO or the portal and they can find somebody who's bigger, faster, stronger than a high school student athlete, typically not all the time. Um, and they're going to take those guys because they're plug and play players. So the high school athlete in all sports, not just baseball, they have a lot of competition. The other thing that if you remember nothing else from tonight other than this, please write this down. The days of early committing, they're done. The days of of worrying about roster spot availability and money, they're done. 
Because if a school is going to have roster spots available for a transfer portal or JUCO transfer, they're going to have roster money in a spot available for a high school senior if they're a late bloomer. Like every college coach to a man says, this is a great rule for the late bloomers because now I'm going to be able to watch how they develop. And, you know, this is the one thing that I try to um, encourage parents to understand. You're never too late if you've taken care of your business in the classroom, you have a focus and attention to detail within the, the weight room or nutrition or sleep, et cetera. But more importantly, you're focused on skill set development all the way through. And if you're taking care of that, there is no case coach in any program at any level or any division of college that is not going to take a player, or a student athlete that's going to help them win. And, you know, so recruiting, there is no must attack, must attend. So that's number one. Number two, college camps. And this is another big subject. You know, I get met with so much pushback. Oh, you're pushing camps. It's a money grab. It's this or that. Okay, here's what camps have really, really become. College camps are not even remotely in any way, shape, or form what they used to be. Here's what they used to be. For the most part, at the Division One level, some Division Twos, most Division Threes, they were a fundraiser for the graduate assistant or the, the uh, volunteer assistant uh, and, you know, the baseball program to help them subsidize going on trips, whether it's West Coast, sometimes it had to do with gear, et cetera, depending upon the level. But now Division One and Division Two camps, even Division Three, those camps play a major role with identifying and getting to know potential student athletes. Now, one, it's skill set, but two, it's personality, and it's also about the opportunity to show your campus. Need you to understand that college coaches really are looking for good people, not just good athletes, good people. Do they shake your hand? Do they look you in the eye? You know, these things that people think are all made up, they're not made up. I mean, if you have talent, yes, that's going to really carry a hammer. But if you're a good person and you ask good questions and you move really well and you interact with teammates or campers, they get to see you on their campus. They get to see how you like their school, how you interact with their coaches. So don't try to go to 50 camps. Try to have a game plan. Like I might have an interest in this camp, this school, from an academic, geographical, cultural, social, and then athletics. Because that's really the last one. Athletics is like, if I got hurt, would I like to be here? And that's what camps have become. It, the dynamic in the, in the landscape of recruiting is not what you're being told. It's not what you're paying these recruiting services for. And on that topic, I get asked all the time and the pushback and the people that shoot me full of holes, you charge for your books. Yeah, I do. I took a long time writing those books, and there's a lot of years of experience in those books. And to be honest with you, $9.99, $14.99, you know, Audible is like $5. I write books. I don't push books. I don't peddle books. I give a lot of books away. What do I do? I'm a guide. I'm not a recruiting service. I do not make promises. Here's what I do. I help athletes get into great academic environments. I help athletes and families choose a plan and, and chart a course. And then I help them choose a destination. We don't chase. I'm talking about boys from Iowa and Texas and California and Louisiana and Florida, all over the country. They're going to schools like Philip Exeter, Phillips Andover, the Salisbury School, Loomis Chafee. A lot of these, you know, all of these schools, postgraduate schools that are big time academic. And then they're going to TCU, Tulane, Vanderbilt, Wake Forest, West Point, um, you know, USC, schools that have good academics, that's what I do. I'm not for everybody. I'm not here to preach what I do. I'm here to tell you I'm not a recruiting service. I'm not here to tell you that you need me. I'm here to tell you the landscape is not 
what it was before COVID, 10 years ago. It doesn't. Why do you think a lot of travel organizations have now created academies, schools? Are they good for some student athletes? Absolutely. Are they good for everyone? No way. We have lost our, our, our kind of our, our way, our moral compass to try to say to someone, come to our school and pay 40000 We have better coaches, better facilities. We play a better schedule, blah, blah, blah. And you're going to go to school online. Uh, what about a prom? What, what about our community? We, we, we're chasing a destination that may not materialize. Now, I get it. Some people want to go there. They want to give it their all. That's great. That's your decision to make. My point of having this discussion tonight is to let you know high school baseball matters. American Legion baseball matters. Not because uh, I'm telling you it does. I'm just telling you that coaches now are not going as much to the high school, the, the travel tournaments. You know where college coaches go now? summer base college summer leagues they go there because just in case somebody hits the portal i can see how that athlete moves and how he might help our program they're spending a lot of time going to college summer leagues they're not going to certain areas of the country for rainouts and if they do go to those areas of the country they're going to stay at the main complex they don't want to drive hours at a time to go to high school Will they? Yes, if your student athlete is elite. Um, you know, but for the most part, the landscape has changed. They rely now on metrics because they can get PDF files from a lot of different Rapsodo, Trackman, uh, Yacker, uh, Blast Motion, uh, Armcare.com, a variety of different technology that now they can follow and track, you know, improvements. Uh, and evaluations from technology there and also game changer you know they can watch games now on on stream they can do a lot of that where they couldn't do that before so college coaches um you know they're not doing the let's go to this place and drive 90 minutes down to the high school field uh because then they're only going to see one player maybe two but if they stay at the complex, they get to see eight games, 10 games, 12 games going on at the same time. They can bounce from field to field. And that's just the way this whole system has now has become. So it boils down to this. Limited roster spots at the college level because more high school students are going to college. There no longer is college juniors and seniors bolting college to go to professional baseball. Why? Because name, image, and likeness is paying some athletes 10 20 40 100 200 400 thousand who wants to leave to go make seven thousand a month in a ball or double a when i can make twenty thousand forty thousand staying in my college or they just don't get the opportunities any longer because now draft is all about you know out of 650 as i alluded to 478 boys were drafted division one and then there were juco players that were drafted so maybe like 500 550 of the uh drafted uh players in the major league draft in 2023 2022 they're college players so now you're trying to fight for room at the end and what ends up happening that caught that high school parents need to understand let's assume player a is at a mid-major team and he doesn't have any intention of transferring. And the season now is 2024. That player goes out and he goes 13 and two with a 278 ERA. Guess where he's going to go? He's going to go to a power four, power three, power five, whatever we have left. Somebody's going to say to him, hey, ho, you might not be in the portal today, but if you come into the portal, we have a, a check and a car for you. That's the reality. So if your son was going to that school as a pitcher, Guess what? The, the portal guy coming in, he's playing. So that's why decisions for college have to be with the game is older. That's one. Two, it's always, always, always going to be an older physically driven sport. 
just like any other sport, football, basketball, but you have to understand, are you preparing as a family, as a student athlete to compete against the older, bigger, stronger, faster players? Roster spots are really hard to come by. The other thing you have to understand, which is why we're having this, is the draft now, Major League Draft, occurs during the Major League All-Star game. They try to, you know, all the glitz and glamour of the draft that the other sports has. Baseball wants to utilize the the appeal of the Major League All-Star game, and they want to have the draft. Now, that may be great for those players that get drafted out of high school, but it sends chaos throughout college. College coaches scramble at all divisions, and here's why. Because July 15th is a portal deadline. You either have to be in or you have to, you know, you have to declare. And so July 15th is kind of like that. We just had the draft. I don't know who's going to get drafted. I don't know if my high school guys are going to sign. I don't know if the JUCO guys that I signed are coming. I don't know if anybody on my team is going to sign. And so all the coaches no longer have roster certainty. So they begin to over-recruit, over-commit, and then they let the chips fall where they may in the fall. That's a reality of college baseball. Doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean it's bad. Doesn't mean coaches that do it are bad. It just means that's their job. That's what they have to do to be competitive. But parents don't take the time to understand that. And we're not getting that information um, handed to us on a regular basis. Okay, I'm going to start to answer these questions in a sentence in a second. But what I also want to explain to you is this. College baseball now uh, has this independence that's about to start to come, meaning in another year or maybe two, but I think within the next 12, could be sooner, 16 months, we're going to see a realignment of college baseball. And we're going to see a shift where X number of teams are going to have to have a $100 million athletic budget, and they're going to offer all 35, uh, maybe 40, I don't think it's going to be 40 full scholarships in a stipend of like 30 to $40,000. So there, there's some sort of cost certainty and there's no, you know, one team can't outbid for the other, you know, that goes on now. And then there's going to be, and I don't like to use the term, the mid major or the football division where they have one A and one double A and baseball is going to have a one double A and, and they're going to have every school will be, will be able to set their roster, uh, the number of uh, scholarships, And then, you know, whether it's 11.7, I think it will go to 15, but some schools won't fully fund that. In other words, all of these changes matter. And you need to understand, you need to get this information because the better informed you are, the better educated you are, the better decisions you're able to make. When I see people on social media, pick your social media of choice. Oh, the world is going to explode. The the doom is coming. You need, you need us. You need this. You need that. That's not what we need. What we need is a sense of calm and we need education and information. And when I talk to parents about the process, there is a a process, meaning academics matter. They really matter. You can't go back when you're a junior or senior to fix a grade when you're a freshman. You need to know that when your student athletes are in the eighth grade, and they're getting ready to make that transition to high school, you know, whether it's with tutors or, or getting the curriculum where your children are going to have the ability to ramp up. You know, you don't have to go in there seeking out AP on a course as your freshman year. A's and B's. You want to be in that window of academic strength because that definitely helps. The other thing I want you to realize is test scores matter. You know, I, I get a lot of pushback. Oh, it's test optional. Well, some schools are switching back to not test optional. But let me explain to you why test optional is not a good way to think. Student athlete, they know you're a good athlete, but they want to know, do you take your studies seriously? Do do, do your grades matter to you? Do you have a drive? Are you engaged? Are you accountable as a student? Do you strive as much for your academics as you do for your athletics? So if you take an ACT, and I get it, ACT and SAT, they're hard. They stink. I get it. Three or four hours of, for some people, misery. But if you show, you know, fortitude towards 
I want to be a better student. And you take that test over and over and over and you get better at it. It shows that you are striving to be the best version of yourself. Don't fall for the trap of test optional. You know, and if you have struggles, get a tutor. Academics and academic money matter. Okay, so let me rattle off some of these questions. Uh, the first one is, I want to answer this definitively, and yes, I'm old and I have glasses. When I talk about youth travel baseball, I in no way am trying to tell parents that those people are bad, the programs are bad, nothing. What I'm trying to say to you, we need to return to the world of communities, the world of neighborhoods, the world of, I'm not living in La La Land. I don't want to return to 1972. I want to tell you that when you get to college, they spend a lot of time trying to assemble a team, a culture of unity, a culture of family. So if you know that's what lies ahead at the high school and college level, why do you want to be on all over and scattered and driving hours and hours? Your friends in your classrooms, you know, first grade through eighth grade, other local communities, you know, the neighboring town, the rival city or town, you want to grow up and you want to have that. It's part of your existence as you become an adult. I still remember to this day, you know, people I played with and against when I was a kid. And so do my sons. So there's something to be said for playing in, with, with your buddies, with your classmates, uh, you know, in your town and surrounding town. So that's the next question always comes what about if a team has JV teams? Now, I talked to Dan Brian at Anna Maria, which is an NCAA Division III team. He has a JV team in Paxton, Massachusetts. He's a Division III team. I talked to Brett Young, the head coach at Barry University, and, and arguably the toughest Division II conference in the country, the Sunshine State Conference, and I, you know, St. Leo. They have JV teams. And, you know, freshmen and sophomores are on that JV team and they start and they work their way up. You know, it's no different than a minor league team trying to aspire to get to the big leagues. JV baseball. Here's what we need to understand. We get better by playing. We get better by getting repetitions. We get better by practicing. So you need to understand that your pathway to the top or your, your dream is going to be filled with peaks and valleys, heartbeats, you know, ups and downs. It's part of baseball. It's like part and parcel. You want to be a baseball player? Here's the good news. It's a great sport. It's the greatest sport of them all. It's America's pastime, bar none. I will always say that till I'm not breathing. And I will die on the mountain when I tell parents, you know, the youth baseball experience needs to be, fun needs to be included. Community needs to be included. And so when we start talking about JV programs, both at the high school level and college, by the way, it's not a death sentence. It's not, you're not being regulated to slave labor. There, it's not like you're going to go someplace and never see the light of day. In fact, I know lots of players, both at the high school and college level, their freshman and sophomore years, they were, they were freshman and JV players. They never sniffed a varsity at bat. A great, great story uh, from Andy Stankowitz, uh, the head coach at USC. He was telling me a story about a young man at, at, at Grand Canyon. And he said, junior year, this young man was a, a college All-American. And so every year, his freshman class that would come in, he would put these statistics on a board. And he would say, junior year, sophomore year, freshman year. And he'd cover up. And so he'd start at the junior year and he'd say, 369, 28 home runs, college up, first team all American, sophomore year, all conference, hit 310, 15 home runs, all conference, freshman year, one for four. Okay, if you knew you were going to have that sophomore and junior year, would you sit as a freshman and get four at bats over four months? Or would you bail? Would you cut and run? Or another story from another coach who told me that his JV player midway through as a shortstop ended up being his starting shortstop at the end of the season. He just couldn't be denied. He showed up every day. He focused on what made him better. He focused on his path. He didn't worry about who was ahead of him, who was behind him. 
And he ended up being the starting shortstop on a, on a college varsity roster. So my point is, JV baseball, freshman baseball, not a death sentence. It's baseball. Lots of people have started, you know, as a non-starter, as a backup, or, you know, as a JV player and had a great career. Uh, let's see, you know, uh, yeah, so I want to focus on one thing. I'm going to talk about post-grad baseball, and I want to say thank you to David. I have made a point a few months ago to tell parents, and I put a post out on social media saying not all postgraduate baseball is the same. Hockey is infamous in the Midwest and the Northeast where they send high school graduates off for two years of junior hockey or one year of postgraduate, and then you enter into a college program. Hockey started this decades ago where they wanted the older guys to be coming in as freshmen at 20 and 21, as crazy as that sounds. Postgraduates are have always, for almost a century, uh, been a part of academia here in the Northeast, in the Mid-Atlantic. And there's many, when I rattle off these schools, the Salisbury School, Cheshire, Avon Old Farms, Loomis Chafee, uh, Andover, Phillips Andover, Phillips Exeter. These student bodies are global. They're international. Each class, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, they basically have anywhere from 80 to 100 total students that represent probably 30 to 40 states as well as other countries from around the world. Prestigious academic schools. The Bush family went to Phillips Andover, the Kennedy family. You know, all of these really famous big corporate political um, that want to focus on academics. And these schools are, are really the Harvard and the Yales, the, the Ivy Leagues of high school. A postgraduate year is one additional year of high school. It's not repetitive. You have the ability to take college caliber classes. Oh, by the way, that transfer to colleges. Uh, it, it allows athletes, it allows students to learn what college is like. You deal with roommates, you deal with laundry, you deal with cafeteria, you deal with a campus, a quad, and it kind of gives you a sense of being independent and on your own and you learn the processes of becoming a college student. A lot of baseball academies have figured out, okay, we're gonna charge families, some cases 20, some cases 50, 60 IMG, um, you know, they off they 80,000 to go to IMG and they offer that extra year. Well, what's happening during that extra year, physical and academic maturation for decades, for centuries, the Ivy leagues and the Patriot leagues, they've done this with students, really high level academic students. And that gap year, uh, I know the Obama's oldest daughter did that before she went into Harvard, um, you know, sometimes people travel abroad to find yourself, to find your areas of interest academically, socially, et cetera. But a postgrad year in today's world makes sense for student athletes that are academically inclined and athletically inclined, meaning you're not just chasing the D1 rabbit. You're chasing the best possible outcome academically, athletically. Schools like Bates, Bowden, Amherst, Tufts, Ohio Wesleyan, Emory, uh, Ohio Wesleyan, et cetera, Division Three, you know, and then the Nesca, uh, excuse me, the Ivies, the Patriot League, Bucknell, Lafayette, Lehigh, Dartmouth, Brown, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, et cetera. I just had Coach Bradley on from Princeton a few weeks ago, and he tells a story about a left-handed pitcher that's currently on his roster who, as a senior, wasn't quite athletically ready, but did a postgrad year, I believe at Andover or Exeter, and is now a potential pro prospect. And people need to take a deeper look into the world of true academic postgraduate schools. I can always give you a list, um, you know, to kind of get you started. Extremely difficult to get into. This isn't a pay to play 
type of thing. It's not a travel team. Now, the baseball academies will take your money in a heartbeat. In fact, I've had students that are juniors in high school where they've had their summer coaches say, come to our uh, academy or come to our school and I'll teach you how to hit. Your coaches don't know what they're doing. I have I have a problem with that because now we're trying to insinuate that certain high schools that might not have the means and they might not have the ability to spend time. There's a time restriction. OK, when you go to one of these academies, they can talk to you all day. Um, and so not all postgrad opportunities are created equal. Do I think they service the way the world is today? Yes. But I think there needs to really be an academic focus with regard to your decision to play postgraduate. Now, another question that I'm getting here, um, and one that I really wanna speak to real quickly, if I can, I know we're running up, I don't wanna keep you uh, much longer. Transfer portal is not division one to division one. Uh, you know, everybody gets lost in that. But I had a good opportunity to talk to the Casey family. In fact, John Casey is now the president of the ABCA. Um, and he's 40 years as a former Tufts coach. Now he coaches at Johnson & Wales as an assistant with his son. A lot of Division Three athletes now are transferring up to Division One. A lot of Division Two to Division One, Division One to Division Two, JUCO, Division Three, II, Division Two. II. My point is, is the transfer portal is not all about life at the Division One to Division One. You get some boys going from NCAA Division One to NAIA Division One. You know where Coach Sheets down at Georgia Gwinnett. I mean, he's getting a lot of great transfers from Division I NCAA. Uh, and that's a great program. And NAIA, the world of which is better, NAIA or NCAA, those days are gone too. NAIA is great baseball. All you have to do is take a look at, you know, Walter State or, or uh, Lewis and Clark or, or obviously Georgia Gwinnett, um, you know, Lee University in, uh, in uh, Tennessee. Uh, you go look at some of their players and they're, you know, they, they have a uh, lineage of major league players that come out of that school. The focus and the point I'm trying to make is college is not about which team has the higher ranked baseball program. Professional baseball is going to find you. If you are a college athlete, I promise you in today's world of social media, these things are everywhere that capture video. Somebody knows somebody, an alumni knows somebody that knows somebody, and they're sending messages. Hey, coach, you need to take a look at this. Hey, this scout needs to take a look at this guy. You want to get someplace where your collective experience as a whole is a double thumbs up. If you can go to college, you're happy. You're happy on the campus. You're happy with your roommates. You're happy with your major. You're happy with the suburban, you know, the, whether it's a big med, major metropolitan city or a suburban area where you can go hunting and fishing, that's what college is all about. College, you're going to meet your best friends. Or you might meet your best man at your wedding. You might meet your future spouse. But I'm telling you, it's you're going to become an alum of a college and you're always going to look back and to see how they're doing, whether it's in sports or what's going on within the world of academia. College selection is bigger than athletics. I can promise you that. That's a fact. Uh, the last thing I want to be able to talk about is um, I had a question that came in about costs, baseball costs. You know, if you're a parent, now I will tell you, as a dad, I, I raised my sons from the ages of five and three until they were men. And at the time, I owned a very small courier service and I drove thousands of miles a week and I made about 45 to $50,000 a year. And especially for my youngest son, travel baseball. And we didn't pay to play on the team, by the way, I'm just telling you to housing, food, transportation, um, you know, a litany of other things that would come up. Um, you know, it was anywhere from ten to twenty thousand dollars from the age of fifteen through this, his junior year into his rising senior year. So my point is affordability. If don't worry if you can't get on the biggest best team. 
focus on skill, strength, speed, scholar, athletes. If you worry about skill, skill you can develop by yourself. You can do it wall ball. You can do a variety of different ways. But you can play American Legion. You can play Babe Ruth. You can play high school baseball. And then you can go to camps because camps really are where the recruiting base is being established. Now, if you want to be a freshman or a sophomore, you want to show some interest to a school, great. But don't go to a camp until you have a tool or tools that are going to excite a coach. And this is another topic, you know, rankings, um, both team rankings and youth rankings. Rankings are subjective. They are in the perspective of somebody that is writing a report on your son. It's not permanent. It's not fatal. It's not, even if it's really, really great, it's not going to last you but a week. And then after a week, you still got to prove yourself again and again and again. So don't worry about rankings. So here's how I want to end tonight's conversation. I didn't have this. I wanted to make sure I did this to let parents know the world of youth baseball is extremely different. It's very, you can manage this. You can educate yourself to this. You can help your son or daughter by just asking questions. Ask your high school coaches. Ask your instructors. Ask your travel ball coaches. Ask them questions. And if they ask you to spend money, whoa, okay. You don't need to spend money to get help with information. That shouldn't be the path. What you need is access. You need to surround yourself with mentors that are going to provide you, your family, your student athlete access, strength and conditioning, nutrition, mental health performance, skill set development, access to people that want to pass the baton of the sport forward. That's the important thing. I understand it's a business. I understand that it's a capitalistic society. I get it. It's That's fantastic. I'm certainly not trying to say spending money is is a, is the root of all evil with baseball. What I'm trying to tell you is learning, taking the time to take a deep breath, take a step back, inform and educate, and then choose. Don't chase. If you're looking to trade athletic ability for academic excellence, you're always going to come out on top. Social media, I'm always available. I help a lot of people. Um, I don't charge a lot of people. I send out a lot of books for free. Uh, you know, I'm not here uh, to do for any other purpose other than my love for the sport. I have a lot of great friends and relationships within the, the game. And if I can help point a family in a direction, I want to do that. I want to help promote college coaches. I want to help promote high school programs and high school coaches. I want to help bring back American Legion baseball because I believe in it, not because I'm compensated. In fact, I'm not compensated for any of that stuff. College coaches don't compensate me. American Legion doesn't compensate me. My point is, it's okay to play Babe Ruth. It's okay to play American Legion. It's okay to just play baseball in the summer. It's okay to put a bat and ball down and begin to take care of your skill set development and your strength. You're not missing out on anything. If I can ever be of any help, you can reach out to me on social media. Every Tuesday, I'm going to start to do a, a forum, a podcast called Baseball Basics. Myself, Tyler, uh, other players at various levels, other coaches at various levels. We're going to talk Baseball Basics on Tuesdays. That's our podcast, which will also be on YouTube. On Thursdays, we're going to maintain Coach Serrano and myself are going to maintain Coach's Corners, where we're going to talk to Division Three, Division Two, NAIA, NCAA Division One coaches. We're going to give you the full spectrum so that you hear directly from college coaches. I want you to know that there's a pathway for those student athletes that have a passion for the sport, have a deep love and a desire, and understand it's hard. The game is hard. There is no easy path. There is no pill to take. You know, I had a great quote this weekend from a coach down in Dallas, and he said, there's a reason why mountains 
are not smooth. There's a reason why mountains are rocky and treacherous. Because when you attempt to climb it, it's an achievement to get to the top. Because it's filled with peaks and valleys and sharp, you know, jagged edges. It's not a smooth walkway or path up a mountain. And that mountain is your student athlete's future. If it was easy, everybody would be a Division I star at LSU or Vanderbilt or Georgia or Alabama, Florida. You know, pick your school, North Carolina, Campbell, uh, TCU, USC, et cetera. It's not. It's hard. And a lot of people get their foot in the door and they fall and they stumble. It's because they truly are not ready to sacrifice for the betterment of the team. They're not willing to pay the price mentally or physically. That's just the fact. And that's why the portal has become a kind of a part and parcel to what the travel ball world looks like. But that's going to change. And it's going to change for the better. So if you have any questions, reach out Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Facebook, email, YouTube, send a comment. I'm not worried about the detractors. I'm not worried about the negativity. I'm not here to compete with anybody. I'm 61 years old. Uh, I've lived it as a player, as a head coach, most importantly, as a dad and now a grandfather. And I simply want to make sure that the game returns to the kids, to the children, to the younger student athletes so that they can live their dreams. They can have their moments, which hopefully turn into memories. And I want them to trade in the gadgets and the gadgets and the gurus for moments, memories, and mentors. Don't try to chase the gurus. Find and surround your student athletes with life mentors that make them better people, better students, and better athletes. So again, I want to thank you for spending your hour with me. I look forward to helping you in any capacity that I can. If you have any questions from today, just go ahead and leave them uh, on the forum here, and I'll make sure I reach out to you directly uh, in whatever social media platform you sent the message. I'll go ahead and respond, and I thank you very much for your time. And here's to a great 2024 year on and off the field. Health, happiness, and your family and your friends. All of the above. Thank you, guys.